my first experience with Buck Rogers was this. Debuted with a theatrical release in 1979 and running for most of two seasons, it was campy, often cringy, and as evidenced by the significant format change between seasons, it never really figured out what it wanted to be. We'll come back to it before the end. Buck Rogers began in the August 1928 edition of Amazing Stories with a novella titled Armageddon 2419, written by Philip Francis Nolan. It's the story of a great war veteran, Anthony Rogers, who is trapped in a mine and by a peculiar combination of gases, slips into suspended animation, only to be awakened 492 years later. He finds that America has been conquered by a Han Empire, and what's left of the non-Chinese population lives in gangs scattered throughout the vast forests of America. Various advanced technologies are introduced, most notably the gravity belts of the Americans that allow them to leap great distances, and the Han disintegrator ray, which does exactly what the name implies. The story spawned syndicated comic strips, a radio show, and its direct competitor, Flash Gordon, with the two franchises being inextricably entwined. Bringing us to 1939, with the first Buck Rogers film serial following on the success of the Flash Gordon serials a few years prior. By this time, Anthony Rogers had become Buck. It's been suggested that the change was to connect the character to the cowboy gunslinger archetype that dominated the action stories of the time. It may also have been thought that Anthony sounded too Italian, given anti-immigrant sentiments in the 1930s and the antics of that Mussolini fellow. Whatever the case, the first Buck Rogers film borrowed heavily from Flash Gordon, to the point of reusing sets and costume pieces. Even the casting was recycled, with Buster Crabbe playing both roles. Instead of nearly dying in a mining accident, in this iteration, Buck is preserved by some magic gas after crashing a friggin' zeppelin into a mountain, which is immensely cooler in my opinion. And no longer did he emerge into a defeated America of scattered gangs hunted by a Chinese empire. Now it was an interplanetary epic with rocket ships and ray guns, though the villains did retain a vague oriental overtone. Where Flash Gordon had Ming the Merciless, Buck Rogers had Killer Kane. I, I, I don't understand, sir. Uh, who is this man called Killer Kane? He is the result of the stupidity of the men of your century. You failed to stamp out lawlessness, and at the end, the criminal became stronger than the law. Racketeers, you call them. You're describing every government ever. These villains are based on a vague Eastern stereotype, Chinese and Mongol elements coupled with industrialization. It's an aspect of the yellow peril fear of the 19th century shifting into a post-colonial view of an awakened and independent Asia as a threat. We see this sci-fi literary thread starting around 1880 with books like Puritan Dooner's The Last Days of the Republic, which by the 20s was influencing books like Olaf Stapleton's Last and First Men and, of course, Armageddon 2419. Japan's expansionism in the 30s further fed into it. Buck Rogers retains those roots, while post-war sci-fi was born in a cultural stew that visualized evil enemies as either cunning Aryan Nazis or brutish Eurasian communists. These two older franchises were anchored in that earlier time and the tropes that came with it. Both endured as serials and comics through the 50s, but the dominant low-grade science fiction of that era was less space opera and more about aliens and flying saucers coming to steal our resources and our women. or monsters created by the atomic age, with a few more thoughtful variations like the day the Earth stood still. In the late 60s, we get to Star Trek, coming at the tail end of that wartime generation in their prime. Gene Roddenberry was a veteran of the war, it was lived experience for him rather than cultural archetypes, so Star Trek's villains aren't knockoff Nazis because Roddenberry drew on the cultural templates of his generation. Trek's villains are modeled on older, classic templates like Romans or Mongols. But by the 1970s, shows and movies were being written by people who grew up in the post-war cultural froth. The Nazi villain archetype was strongest here, one generation removed from reality. The 70s and 80s are kind of the heyday of the jackbooted space fascist. And Buck Rogers in the 25th century comes on the scene in the middle of it. 
The late 70s Star Wars money grab saw not only the creation of new properties like Battlestar Galactica, but the resurrection of long dormant franchises that suddenly smelled like money. Because Buck Rogers was drawing on pre-war material for its imagery, its big villains were still influenced by a vaguely pan-Asian aesthetic rather than being another iteration of space Nazis. On the surface, the show was campy nonsense full of whatever level world building and goofy sexual inferences that today would spark some Twitter rage with episodes like Planet of the Slave Girls, Planet of the Amazon Women, Woman Unchained. These are all real episode titles. You get a good sense of the level of storytelling that you're in for. But it's all built on the tower of silver screen serials and pulp comics that came before. In the show, we still have Kane as the villain, though now he's less an evil mastermind and more a minder for Princess Ardala. Not to be confused with Flash Gordon's Princess Ara. They both dress like showgirls and prowl after the hero, much to the irritation of their fathers. Ardala always has a burly slave on hand. For example, Tiger Man, or later, Panther Man. I think I'll call you Panther Man. You're black. You're beautiful. Yeah, it was a different time. Which brings me to another interesting detail of the time. Tell me about the Holocaust. It's the only man-made thing still standing since the Holocaust. It's ironic to think that when the Holocaust hit, he never had a chance to get here. I guess we never will know how the Holocaust started. This was the first time I'd heard that word as a manling in 1980. The word Holocaust wasn't yet narrowly defined. It didn't really start transforming into the capital H Holocaust until about the mid 60s. And it didn't become the primary meaning most people think of until a decade or so after that. The Buck Rogers TV series came right at the moment of that particular linguistic shift. But that's a discussion about the interplay between history, politics, and culture for another time. Buck Rogers is at its roots, a post-apocalyptic dystopia. But by the time Buck Rogers in the 25th century is on the air, the story is post-apocalyptic in the same way that Star Trek is. Yes, a nuclear war ruined everything and killed most folks, but it was a long time ago and we're better now. To illustrate this shift, we have the character of Wilma Deering. We progress from the forest-dwelling freedom fighter of the original story through the sidekick of the serials, Ending with a character that starts as a strangely naive fighter pilot and ends up in this stewardess outfit. With each iteration, the society Wilma lives in assumes more stability and less survival urgency. Even looking only at the television series, we begin the first episode with radiation-scarred mutants still living in the ruins of Chicago, and by season two, they're sending expeditions to explore the galaxy as though they're part of some knockoff United Federation of Planets. The show is fleeing from its roots. The franchise lost touch with its essence through each iteration, slipping into self-referential parody. And it's the same process we see happening now with the post-war space Nazi trope, which has ceased to be a viable villain template played straight. Using recent Star Wars as an example, we have either a ridiculous caricature like we see in the First Order, or as with Andor and Solo, we see an effort to shift to a more grounded, mundane sort of military police bureaucratic oppression that uh, sadly has become all too familiar to most of us. But the time for Buck Rogers' return to its roots may be coming. A story about heroic American malcontents fighting against a Chinese-controlled global empire fits the zeitgeist a bit more than a collective rebel alliance fighting mechanized battles against a monolithic army of space Nazis ruled by a mad Fuhrer with occult powers. What resonated with audiences decades ago seldom works today, but reaching back a full century may be surprisingly relevant. I don't expect a straight Armageddon 2419 adaptation will ever happen, not least because Hollywood is deathly afraid of offending the Chinese government. But it would make for an interesting film if any studio had the stones to make it. What is going on with that beret?